Hello, welcome back. This is the third video in the short series looking at some of the more advanced parts of the Spectrum Next. If you've not seen the others, go watch them after this one. In this video, we're looking at how to program the DMA controller in the Spectrum Next. So the first video was all about memory banking and how to make use of that wonderful megabyte of RAM available in the Spectrum Next. The second video was a look into the bizarre world of the Spectrum's interrupt handler. Now we're going to see how the DMA controller works and what we can do with it. This will be technical, it will include code on how to do this using Z88DK and C for the Spectrum Next. Pretty advanced technique, but it's quite understandable and can add some nice speed boost to code if it's used appropriately. DMA, or Direct Memory Access, is a way to allow devices access to system RAM without the CPU being involved. On the Z80 computers, there did exist a DMA controller chip that people could use, and there's even been a few expansion cards made for the Spectrum to make use of them. However, like most things on the Spectrum that weren't standard, nobody really used them. I remember getting a mouse as a kid for my Spectrum for Christmas, being quite excited about it, before then realising that nothing but the packaged art programme could really make use of it. It wasn't standard, nobody used it. Fortunately for us, the Spectrum Next comes with its own DMA controller as standard. It can be programmed to transfer blocks of memory from one location to another, or to I.O. ports. As I hinted in the introductory and memory banking videos, the DMA is a way to quickly send data to things like the screen, and that's mostly what my code explanation will demonstrate. The DMA controller in the Next is a programmable device, and it has a few registers that we need to write to. This is well documented in the Spectrum Next wiki, which is here. The documentation is very comprehensive, but it can take a few goes to make sense of. So let's go through this step by step, looking at some sample code so you can see how it works. So we have seven registers. They're called WR0 up to WR6. Writing to them is like when we configured the sprite system in my other video. Each register is accessed through the same I.O. port and the pattern of the first three bits is what tells the DMA controller which register you're writing to. Now you'll need to break out Windows Calculator and put it in programming mode or use some other scientific calculator that can do binary because we need to calculate binary and hex to program this thing. So this is WR0 and here's what it needs to contain. It's mostly an exercise in working out bit patterns and setting them. The thing to understand is the bottom four parts of the diagram. What this is trying to explain is that if you set bit 3 of WR0 to 1, after writing the byte to WR0, the next byte will set the port A starting address's low byte. If you set bits 3 and 4, the first write would then set port A starting address low byte, then the high byte. So don't accidentally write what you think is WR1 next. It'll get interpreted as port A's address. Here's my code for DMA copying screen data to the layer 2 screen. First, I load the layer 2 screen into banks of memory and banked in 16K of image data into MMU2 and 3. This covers the top third of the screen. Go watch my layer 2 video if you need to know more. Then, I start programming the DMA controller. And this is where things get a little bit weird. So, hex 7D in binary is 0111-1101. And what that means is we want to use transfer mode we want to write from port A to port B. I want to set port A's low and high bytes and also the block length. So if I write 00, zero and then 40 hex next, that means I'm setting port A's address to 4000 hex or bank 2 if you look on the memory map. If I then write 00, zero and 40 again, it means I now want to transfer 4000 hex of data or 16k. It's a pure coincidence that that is the same 4000 as port A's address. They're not linked in any way. And that's WR0 configured. We've written into it three times. We now need to write into WR1. So what we do is we write hex 14 to it, which is bit pattern 00010100. The first three bits have to be 100. I think this is how the hardware knows we want WR1 and not WR0 because on WR0, you can't write bit pattern 100. It's not allowed. We then set a zero to say port A is memory, and a one to say we're incrementing port A's address, and then zeros for everything else. We've now got port A configured, 
with its starting address, transfer size, and that we're incrementing the copy. WR2 is pretty much the same. We write 10 hex to it, which is just to say we need to increment port B when we copy it. We can ignore WR3. Not quite sure what its purpose is. Even the documentation says it's better to use WR6. So we go on to WR4, which configures how the copy should happen and where port B even is. I'm copying to location zero hex, and I want to use burst mode copies. I don't know why I want to use burst mode copies, but it works. So we're writing 00, zero twice to set port B's address. We can then ignore WR5, because as by default, it seems to stop after copying, which is what we want. Finally, we need to set WR6 with the following bit pattern, 11001111. First, bit 0 and 1 need to be a 1. Then the pattern 10011 means load, and bit 7 needs to be a 1. Finally, we then write hex 87, or 10000111, which is the bit pattern to enable DMA and to kick the whole thing off. This style of program is weird. It's like you're repeatedly writing to the same memory location, as if you're just overwriting the contents. Behind the scenes, this is all turned into assembly out instruction. They go to hardware ports, not RAM. The Z80 isn't a memory map CPU, so we have to tell it specifically to write to attached hardware. Fortunately, Z88DK understands what's going on with this, and it doesn't optimize all this away. It knows that we're writing to next registers and what's going on. So that's one DMA copy done. Setting up another for the next third of the screen is even easier. The whole thing doesn't need reprogramming. In fact, all we need to do is bank in the next piece of image data, disable the DMA, which we might not actually need to do, and then tell it to load the data again so the counters in the DMA reset. And then we just tell it to begin. All the memory addresses are the same. The only thing that's different is we bank switch some RAM around. And that's it. You do that three times, you've written to the screen. And that's the DMA. Configuring it is pretty straightforward. And as you can see, it's far quicker than what the CPU can do, even at 28 megahertz. The only thing to know is this is purely a DMA. It can copy continuous runs of bytes. It's not a blitter. So you can't copy rectangular blocks of RAM around. You can't copy, say, one part of the screen to another. Also for small copies, the setup and configuration may actually be slower than doing it by hand with mem copy. It's definitely something to use with large amounts of data. For example, a music playing routine running in a V-blank interrupt would use this to feed the audio hardware with sound data. Or you could do things with the copper chip and DMA repeated data into it. So there we go. It's kind of quite an in-depth look at the innards of the next. Um, I've kind of run out of these videos a little bit to make because the next bit I need to learn more advanced things myself. So what am I going to do next? Well, I'm going to keep exploring the workings of the next. There's like the tile map and sound still to figure out. But that'll take time and I need to do more than just show you how to turn things on and shovel data into it. I need a kind of working example. So I'm going to keep working on my game idea and use that to help me learn all this stuff better. But it just kind of that's going to take time. But it does mean I'm now free to expose some more of the content ideas that I've got and that I've had queued up for a while. All this kind of low level poking around at the next has given me a bit of a taste for microcontrollers, embedded hardware. I want to learn more about that part of computing and then share what I find with you. Also, I own a bunch of these things. The smart socket thingies. They're all based off ESP8266 microcontrollers. There's one in there somewhere. I've reprogrammed this one. And I've got a bunch of microcontrollers as well. So this is a little thermal sensing board that I've built. And I've got into this whole Internet of Things smart home nonsense. You know, I'm the generation that grew up watching Tomorrow's World telling us about self-driving cars and household robots. I want that stuff, it's cool. What I don't want though is all that dystopian crap where these things have to phone home to China and collect data about us and tell the internet what we like and all that crap. Also, it doesn't make sense that for me to turn this on, there has to be a round trip to a server in China just to switch a light on that I'm sat next to. Kind of doesn't sell these things very well. So what I've been figuring out is how to build my own smart devices and how to hack these things so that they don't feel compelled to phone home. 
and it's quite fun. Like, I had to dremel this one to bits to get inside it. So if you like that kind of low level thing, there'll be some more of that. I'm also the generation that grew up with these books. These are cool. And, you know, I've got quite a few of these. And it might be interesting working through some of the things that are inside them, trying to build these different things, like building some sort of little robot thing based off ancient instructions. And then seeing if I can update it. Or some creepy old programming from a long dead language. See what that's like. So if you're still watching, well done for making it to the end. Do me a favour, press the subscribe button if you haven't already, and maybe share the video somewhere if you think it deserves it. And until next time, see you later. And I've got quite into that whole Internet of Things smart home nonsense. You know, I'm the generation that cannot fit his head in the frame and needs to do this again. For God's sake.